The Tom Woods Show, episode 1447. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level Tom Woods is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education. History, economics, and more the way it ought to be taught with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I have just returned from the Contra Cruise. We had a tremendous trip to Alaska. Very, very memorable and enjoyable. I will have some details on the debate. If you haven't followed me on Twitter, you may not know what happened with regard to my debate with Bob. So I'll keep you hanging on that for a minute. Otherwise, go on Twitter, follow me at Thomas E. Woods, and you'll find out all the details. Anyway, I just was not able to get 10 episodes out. I mean, the the week that I left and the week that we were gone, uh, only nine. So this was one I was going to run in my absence, and it just couldn't happen. But I think it's one you're going to enjoy. This is actually drawn from my Liberty Classroom website, libertyclassroom.com. This is Jason Jewell. Second time I've featured one of his talks. Uh, He has a couple of courses, several courses with us, and one of them is a history of conservatism and libertarianism. And in this particular talk, he looks at the interwar period, Anglo-American politics in the interwar period, and then also talks about Churchill, who of course was an interwar figure as well, but also plays obviously a dramatic role in World War II. So we're going to get some discussion of that and some of the, let's say, revisionist takes on Churchill. So I think you'll enjoy it. I mean, it's meant to be delivered not as a rah-rah red meat speech at a Ron Paul rally, which is what a lot of my talks are. Uh, It's meant to be an academic talk for people who just want more knowledge. And so that's what you're going to get. Jason, by the way, is the chairman of the Department of Humanities at Faulkner University and just an all-around great, very, very smart and totally and, and criminally underrated scholar in my opinion, just a a great, great guy. I will say that coming up on libertyclassroom.com, we have a course coming from Deidre Berzer on Latin American history. Good luck finding a course in Latin American history that isn't Marxist or quasi-Marxist. Good luck. You're not going to find it. It's impossible. Scholars of that area are just ideologically a mess. So to find somebody who's on our side, who's going to teach the real history of Latin America, that's amazing. And I don't know where else you're going to get that other than Liberty Classrooms. That's coming up soon. Uh, of course, on Jacksonian America coming up from Brad Berzer, Deidre's husband. But then also in the relatively near future, the second half of Jeff Herbener's 20th Century American Economic History course. And wow, the second half is uh, – actually, and it's not just 20th century. It's, it's all of American history. But the second half of the course would be primarily 20th century. And think of all the topics that need to be covered and explained in that uh, period of American history – it's going to be amazing to have access to this. There's nothing like this anywhere. So you really, really want to know the real stuff and spare yourself trying to glean little nuggets from 300 books. I'll save you some time. Libertyclassroom.com is how you do that. So go over and grab a subscription. You can get a coupon, by the way, at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. Hmm, how about that? And remember, I am pronouncing that word correctly. I don't want to hear any of you uh, old ladies who pronounce it coupon, okay? You know, leave me alone. It's coupon. Libertyclassroom.com slash coupons is how you get a little discount. Okay, so here comes Jason Jewell, and I hope you enjoy it. Hi, and welcome to Lecture 17 of A History of Conservatism and Libertarianism. In this lecture, we're going to take a step back and look at some of the broader trends that are happening in Anglo-American politics in the early 20th century. And we'll talk specifically about the impact of uh, World War I, the fate of classical liberalism, and uh, then focus more specifically on Winston Churchill, who is considered by many people to be the greatest conservative figure of the 20th century, and in the eyes of many people, the greatest statesman of any kind of the 20th century. So as an overview, we'll uh, start off by talking about what World War I did to the political discussion on both sides of the Atlantic and how it changed conservatism into a more uh, anti-war, non-interventionist, isolationist, whatever term you want to use there, uh, into more of that posture. 
and how, of course, this in the American case helps to bring about more of a convergence with classical liberals. Remember, the liberals had typically taken an anti-war, pro-peace position. Although in the United Kingdom, classical liberalism is eclipsed and, and ceases to be a major political force. We'll talk some about fascism. Of course, fascism fascism is often described as a movement of the right, a conservative movement. So we'll analyze that claim a little bit and talk a little more about how conservatives reacted to the New Deal in the United States. Of course, we talked about that some in uh, the previous lecture. And then um, focus on World War II, and particularly the role of Winston Churchill. So in World War I, uh, again, this is a a point that uh, 21st century libertarians and some conservatives often make, that throughout most of the 20th century, wars were waged by the left. Uh, World War I, in particular, uh, was a war that in the English-speaking world came about as the result of decisions made by leaders who were considered to be on the left of the political spectrum. In the United States, of course, the president that maneuvered the United States into the war was Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, a progressive. And in the United Kingdom, the prime minister for uh, most of the war is David Lloyd George, the leader of the Liberal Party. The liberals are in power when the war begins in Britain. But because of the... uh, poor handling of the war effort, particularly the failure of the Gallipoli invasion, the outcry against that led to Lloyd George's forming a coalition government with the conservatives. Lloyd George remained the prime minister, but in fact, most of the cabinet positions were held by conservatives. Now, that coalition stayed in power um, until uh, up to and after the end of the war. But the uh, war severely damaged the reputation of the liberals. When we get to the post-war period, those of you who are familiar with American history know very well the uh, fallout from the war in the United States, how Woodrow Wilson came into the Paris Peace Conference in early 1919 with uh, this very idealistic vision of what the post-war settlement ought to look like, he compromised away most of his um, ideas in favor of the British and French insistence on a punitive peace against Germany. But he hung on to the idea of a collective security arrangement that would be known as the League of Nations, staked a lot of his political capital on this, and finally got the British and French to agree to the formation of this League of Nations, which was written into the Treaty of Versailles, the treaty that was going to make the formal peace with the defeated Germany. However, Wilson had alienated the Republican Party in a number of ways. Uh, One was by not taking any high-ranking Republicans with him to Europe uh, to participate in the peace talks. So that was seen as a sort of personal snub. Uh, to the leaders of the Republicans, but then also because we had had um, elections in 1918 in which the Republicans had done very well. There was uh, war fatigue and all the, the rest of it that comes along after having been in a conflict like this. And now there is a lot of resistance to the idea of the League of Nations. The leader of the group that was resisting this treaty, which included the League of Nations in it, was the Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, a Republican senator. So uh, you may know the story. Wilson comes back and tries to drum up support for the treaty by traveling across the country. He winds up having a stroke in the process. And when all is said and done, the treaty is not ratified by the United States Senate. And The result of all this is that technically the United States remains at war uh, with Germany for another year or so until they finally work out a uh, uh, another peace treaty. But the United States does not sign on to the Treaty of Versailles, thus it does not join the League of Nations. So there's definitely a resistance that's supported by the American public to uh, getting involved in more European conflicts. We don't want to have some kind of open-ended commitment to have to send resources or troops especially 
over to Europe to try to help the Europeans sort out their squabbles. This was not a good deal for us. We don't want it to happen again. And this was a conservative position in the United States throughout the 1920s and, and 1930s. In Great Britain, the Conservative Party wins a general election in 1922, and the liberals are out for good. They never again uh, are a governing party in British politics. From that point on, the conservatives uh, are in office for the rest of the 20s and, and throughout the 30s with uh, one or two episodes where they are sharing power with the Labour Party. And it's in this period when conservatives begin to have some doubts about the British Empire. Now, the British Empire reached an, ex uh, an extent that was greater than ever before at the end of World War I because under the League of Nations, the British wound up administering some of the pieces of the old Ottoman Empire uh, in the Middle East. The Ottoman Empire had been broken up uh, as of, after the war. So the British are controlling more territory than ever before, but it's a tremendous drain on British resources. The British had liquidated a lot of their overseas investments, their capital, in order to uh, fund the war. And now trying to maintain this empire is proving to be uh, very challenging. So there's talk in the Conservative Party about maybe we need to start dismantling some of the empire. And in particular, there's a lot of discussion about India. Should India be given some degree of autonomy and will back off the administration of India? So this is causing a debate within the conservative party. So there's, there's a move away from the pro-imperial position uh, within the conservatives. Now, as, as I said, the British public, for the most part, wound up blaming the Liberal Party for World War I. Uh, first of all, for you know, getting the country into it, and then uh, mismanaging the war effort. And those, those of us who are Americans may not realize that Britain actually lost, I think, about twice as many soldiers in World War I uh, killed as they did in World War II. So it was, a, it was a more damaging episode for the British than World War II was. We always think of World War II as the big war, particularly from the American point of view, because there were more Americans in Europe and in the Pacific in World War I. The death toll for Americans was higher in World War II. But for the British, it was the other way around. So this was really something that left a big scar on the national consciousness. And if you go to any village in Britain, Scotland, England, Wales, you go to any small village, you go into the center of town, and there's going to be a World War I monument there with a list of all the boys from that village, the young men who were killed in the war. There may be a World War II monument as well, but invariably, the list of names from World War I is much longer than that from World War II. So this is, uh, again, I'm dwelling on this a little bit to try to drive home what a big deal this was uh, to the British public. And the liberals take the blame for this. So... The liberals, because of the war, lose out politically, but then also they have lost their ability to present themselves to the British public as the champions of the little guy. This was the uh, one of the liberal electoral strengths throughout the 19th century. They could pose as the champion of the working class family because they were the ones who were fighting for eliminating tariffs getting rid of the tax burden. They had these slogans like freeing the breakfast table in the 19th century. We're going to get rid of the tax on tea, the tax on coffee. The whole free trade idea was one that uh, played very well to the working class because they could see how they were being taxed for these things that they were trying to acquire uh, imported goods. But now because the Labor Party has come up since 1900 and has positioned itself as the voice of working class interests, fighting not just for low taxes for the working class, but for outright subsidies. Now that uh, more and more working class people have received the franchise in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we run into that problem that has been recognized for, for many centuries, that um, a democracy is always susceptible to the temptation that the public can vote itself benefits from the, from the public treasury. 
And this is what starts to happen as the Labor Party gains more and more support. The working class people increasingly are throwing their support to labor and the liberals get eclipsed as a result of this. So classical liberalism fades as a, a potent political and electoral force in Britain. The, the Labor Party replaces the Liberal Party as the second major party in Britain, and that's true down to the present day. Now, in, in 2010, there was a coalition of conservatives and what were then called the Liberal Democrats. And the Liberal Democrats were, in some respects, the inheritors of the old uh, Liberal Party, but a lot of the positions had changed along the way, and there's very little recognizable in the Liberal Democrats of 2010 from what was there um, in the year 1900. And then in the 2015 election, the Liberal Democrats got almost completely wiped out. They lost uh, 80% or so of their electoral seats and had, I think, fewer than 10 seats in Parliament after the general parliamentary election in 2015. So uh, the Liberal Party uh, is, is is no longer really a major force in uh, British politics. Now, over in the United States, we've got this ideology of progressivism that we talked a little bit about in the last lecture. Progressivism is about government activism in the name of helping the poor and that sort of thing. So you've got some sort of working class uh, politics trade union influence on politics, that sort of thing, happening in the United States. And there's a progressive influence on both of the major parties in the early 20th century. And we call this, again, the progressive era in um, American history. Both Republican presidents and Democratic presidents are often described by historians as progressive figures who favor this activist government that's not at all in accordance with the ideas of classical liberalism, which in the United States, it was the Democratic Party that had been the primary uh, exponents of ca uh, classical liberalism in the 19th century, particularly uh, the Southern Democrats. So what happens in the United States is that the classical liberals begin to converge with the, the conservative sensibility. And we saw this in an earlier lecture, how uh, Russell Kirk had described the frustrated conservatives of the late 19th century who began to advocate classical liberal proposals that were aiming for conservative ends, such as the maintenance of the gold standard and, and that sort of thing. So in the 1920s, we see what looks like a, a dose of classical liberalism coming into the Republican Party and Republican presidents like Harding and Coolidge exercising some restraint and not being willing to have uh, an activist government like their Republican presidents, such as uh, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, had endorsed. So the advocates of classical liberalism come to be seen as conservatives, and that identification has remained pretty much intact in American politics throughout the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st century, which is why libertarians uh, who by and large, are the inheritors of the classical liberal tradition to a great extent, are routinely described as right-wing in the American uh, system. Now, that's not at all the case um, on the European continent, for example. Uh, there, the people who advocate laissez-faire and that sort of thing are still considered liberals. But in the United States, and to some extent later on down the road in Britain, that association of classical liberalism with the right uh, gets entrenched, whereas the left becomes much more the progressive statism, advocates of socialism and so on. So this brings us into a consideration of fascism, which, as I said earlier, is routinely described as a movement of the right. And so this is um, an argument that's been happening since the 40s, really, is fascism of the left or of the right. And in my experience, your answer to this question depends on what your own political emphasis is. If you are concerned mainly with questions of economics, I believe you're much more likely to describe fascism as a movement of the left because economically it's about the corporate state and bureaucratic socialism and that sort of thing. So as classical liberals become associated with the right for whatever reason, 
and and the minimal government, the laissez-faire position, they will see fascism with its bureaucratic socialist policies as the statist program of leftists. On the other hand, if you are a, a Marxist, for example, who believes in the Marxist uh, party line of international socialism and how your class identity is the main thing uh, about you and that your nationality is not significant, then you are likely to interpret fascism as a movement of the right because another aspect of fascism was its intense nationalism. And if you identify the left with internationalist socialism, then anything that is nationalist must be of the right. And we saw in an earlier lecture how the idea of nationalism comes to be associated more and more with conservatism in the second half of the 19th century. And certainly the fascists do appeal uh, in, in their nationalist propaganda to certain institutions and symbols um, uh, that are associated with the traditional society. The fascists tended to glorify the army, for example. They would glorify the, the flag. Uh, these sort of traditional institutions that conservatives felt some affinity with, the fascists would try to appeal to people with a conservative temperament by uh, trying to uh, idolize these uh, institutions. So, again, it, it depends on more of what you are um, focusing on. Economically, fascism appears to be something of the left. Culturally, at least the trappings of it appear to be more something of the right. However, it's worth noting that in Italy and in Germany, the places where fascism have the most influence, I mean, the, the traditional conservatives understood very well that the, the fascists were not like them. The conservative parties in, uh, in Germany, uh, they, they would never have considered the Nazis to be conservative. They said these people are radicals. They want to make these really fundamental changes in, in German life in a number of ways. So it's, it's a tricky um, question. Is, is it left or right? And I think to some extent this um, it helps to illustrate the, the poverty of the left-right uh, political spectrum to some extent, uh, because you can find authoritarian uh, personalities and totalitarian personalities on, on both ends of this traditional uh, left-right spectrum. Now, in the English-speaking world, for a number of years, there seems to be some confusion as, as to what fascism actually is, because people like Mussolini, who, of course, is the, the creator of the fascist program, uh, never sets out in a systematic and programmatic way, here is what fascism is. Here's what we stand for. I mean, the fascists from day one were always much more vocal about what they were against than what they were for. And certainly they were against Bolshevism. They were against communism. So, uh, again, if, if you identify the left with communism and Marxist ideology, then um, you are likely to see fascism as a movement of the right. So for conservatives in uh, Britain and America who knew from day one that they opposed Bolshevism, they, they looked at the Russian Revolution with horror right from the get-go. Um, and here are the fascists saying, we oppose to the death uh, Bolshevism. The conservatives in Britain and America for a number of years were willing to give the fascists a sort of sympathetic hearing, and uh, particularly the conservatives who weren't really strong on the economics, uh, who didn't really uh, embrace the laissez-faire uh, insights. So to them, the, um, the bureaucratic aspects of management of the economy wasn't as much as, of a turnoff as it was to the more individualist writers in Britain and America in the uh, 20s and 30s. There are fascist movements in both the, uh, Britain and in the United States. They're always quite small in comparison to what you saw on the European continent. But the primary fascist figure in Britain is a guy named Oswald Mosley, whose dates are 1896 to 1980. He organized uh, a group called the British Union of Fascists. And throughout the 1930s was... Uh, very vocal in his support of Mussolini and, um, and, and Hitler and said that Britain needs to adopt similar policies, uh, to Italy and Germany in order to manage the problems of the Great Depression. In the United States, there's not really a, a significant fascist political party, 
But there are some prominent figures in American life who are saying that we need to listen to what the fascists are saying and seriously consider what they're doing. They may have some solutions to the problems. Because remember, uh, in the 20s and 30s, there was this impression that was given off, you know, that, that Mussolini was the first Italian leader to make the trains run on time and that Hitler seemed to have um, pulled Germany out of the Great Depression with the public works and all that sort of thing. And uh, if you've read any of the libertarian literature about the, the Depression, then uh, no doubt you know that the New Deal Brain Trust was looking to the fascist models of, of corporatism and particularly in Italy, but to some extent in Germany as well, to try to get some ideas for how to um, uh, cartelize the American economy. But in but the popular culture, there are a couple of um, figures, intellectuals, who uh, try to give fascist ideas a broader hearing. One of them is uh, Father Charles Coughlin, a uh, Catholic priest who had a tremendously popular radio program Throughout the 1930s, it's estimated that at, at one point there were 40 million people listening to his radio show. Now, that, that's a huge number of people at any point, but you think about the, the population of the United States being significantly smaller in the 1930s than it is today. And this is a, a big chunk of the U.S. population that's tuning in to listen to these radio broadcasts. Coughlin also had a periodical called Social Justice, uh, in which he uh, gave uh, ideas about uh, fascist economics and, and that sort of thing. And also, Coughlin uh, has been condemned by a lot of historians for um, you know uh, descending into anti-Semitic rants uh, from time to time. Now, anti-Semitism is not an inherent feature of fascism. Uh, Mussolini's regime was never particularly anti-Semitic until he started sending Jews out, you know, just to make Hitler happy during the war. It's uh, Nazism that uh, really brings in the uh, anti-Semitic ingredient that wasn't nearly as present in a number of other uh, fascist uh, organizations. There's also um, a publisher named Seward Collins who gave uh, air to a lot of fascist ideas in the 1930s. Collins was the founder and publisher of the, the periodical The American Review, which in general, was kind of an anti-modern conservative journal. And as he launches the American Review, Collins writes in an editorial that he's trying to create a platform for several of the groups that we've already looked at. He says, I, I really like the new humanists. I want them to write for me. I like the British distributists. I like the Southern agrarians. And he also says he wants to have the, um, the neo-scholastic writers, the 20th century advocates of Aristotelian and, and Thomistic uh, philosophy from the Roman Catholic world. So this is a journal that is critiquing modernity from that traditionalist viewpoint. But Collins himself also said, you know, we, we need to, we need to consider what the fascists are doing. And he expressed some hope uh, in developments in American politics in the 1930s that maybe uh, Franklin Roosevelt would help to reform American politics and, uh, create a stronger executive. For Collins, this was a good thing. He considered this to be the cure for the uh, plutocratic system that had developed in the United States. So he's, he's uh, definitely saying we need a more monarchical system. So li listen to this uh, editorial from Collins in the um, American Review. What can be done to reform our plutocratic state called capitalism? In the first place, a plutocracy cannot reform itself. An oligarchical regime which was not at the beginning of its power that rare historical phenomenon, an aristocracy, cannot make itself an aristocracy as its power and popularity wane. In other words, the, the difference between an aristocracy and a plutocracy is that an aristocracy has this sense of noblesse oblige, that it is going to attempt to govern in the interests of the whole people as opposed to its own narrow class interests. Whereas a plutocracy, which is just a rich people controlling the state, they have no interest in uh, you know, helping anybody else out. They're just in it to, to create more wealth for themselves. So he says that this plutocracy that we have is not going to be able to turn itself into an aristocracy. Neither the soil nor the seeds of aristocracy are, pr are present. Not only is the aristocratic solu solution impossible, but the democratic solution as well. 
the people are powerless to recover the state from a plutocracy, nor will a plutocracy voluntarily abdicate in favor of its subjects. A plutocracy will grant concessions, punish flagrant offenders among its members, offer bribes, make promises, but it cannot reform itself and it will not abdicate. What recourse remains? Besides aristocracy and democracy, there is only one form of government, monarchy. The only way to conquer a plutocracy is by means of a monarch. There is no other way possible, nor is any other necessary. Now, Collins is not explicitly saying that we need to crown Franklin Roosevelt the king of America, but he's saying that this idea of the monarchical principle of power resting in one leader who is going to uh, take the interests of, of the whole nation in, in mind and try to govern in that interest, that's what he's defining as a monarch. And he considers this a conservative uh, idea that uh, the monarch can can see the interests of everybody and, and try to balance them as, as, as the wise uh, ruler. And this would be the cure for plutocracy. Now, certainly the other contributors to the American Review did not all uh, agree with this. But this is an example of how you see e even these, these vestiges of, uh, of an old European monarchical uh, leaning uh, in the United States. So varying responses to fascism um, among conservatives. Now, of course, once the... Um, once the war begins, a lot of those voices uh, go quiet. But leading up to the war in the 1930s, uh, conservatives are very much interested in trying to avoid another war for the most part. Now, we've got the conservative government in Great Britain, and it follows this policy of appeasement throughout the 1930s. And the key figures here are Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain, who were both prime ministers from say, the mid-1920s up until about 1940. And this policy of appeasement had great popular support. Of course, the, the key moment in the appeasement policy was when a Chamberlain went to Munich to negotiate with Hitler over Hitler's seizure of the Sudetenland, the region in western Czechoslovakia. And Chamberlain believed Hitler's assurances that he didn't want to take all of Czechoslovakia. He just wanted the Sudetenland, which was historically German. And even though Britain had a treaty, a defensive alliance with Czechoslovakia, he negotiated with Hitler to say, okay, well, you can have that if you promise not to take anything else. And he goes home and says, we've got peace in our time. Uh, up until that point, Hitler had been making demands for territory and for um, modifications to the Treaty of Versailles. That did seem reasonable to a lot of British and French people because there was this growing sense in the 20s and 30s that the Treaty of Versailles had been a raw deal for Germany, that Germany had been treated unjustly and that Hitler was uh, legitimately uh, asking back for some of the uh, historic German territory that would restore German national unity and, and German dignity. So uh, Chamberlain and, and other conservatives were sympathetic to this idea. In the United States, there continues to be this very um, you know, anti-war feeling, and this is usually described often in a derogatory fashion as isolationism, but this includes um, tariff barriers that, that are put up in 1930, particularly the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which raised uh, trade barriers you know, very high. And then as the 1930s wear on and there are rumblings of uh, possible war coming in Europe, that uh, dominant American feeling was, if it happens again, we've got to stay out of it. And there are some very high-profile spokesmen for this anti-war position. Uh, one of them was Charles Lindbergh, the guy who had achieved world fame for making the first non-stop transatlantic airplane flight back in the late 20s. And Charles Lindbergh was a significant figure in what was called the America First Committee. This was a uh, an organization of, of prominent people who were say, saying, whatever happens, w w the American government has to consider American interests first and foremost, and that means staying out of any war and not sending our young men to go off and die halfway around the world for some cause that we don't really understand or know anything about. So this is a very strong current of opinion uh, in the 1930s. Now, of course, when, uh, as I said, when the war starts, most of the... Uh, these voices like the America First Committee after Pearl Harbor, they say, well, you know, national pride, patriotism, whatever, we, we, we've got to fight now. Uh, and so there's no point in, in this anymore. And they shut down the America First Committee. 
in Britain, when Hitler continues to make further demands against Poland, after taking all of Czechoslovakia in early 1939, at that point, the conservative government says, okay, well, we made a mistake, and now we're going to give Poland a war guarantee. But Hitler didn't believe that the British would actually make good on that guarantee, so he felt emboldened to attack uh, Poland in September of 1939, but, and that starts World War II with the uh, British de and French declaration of war against Hitler. But that brings us to a discussion of Winston Churchill, whose dates are 1874 to 1965. As I said, Churchill is considered by many people to be the greatest statesman of the 20th century. In one of these polls, he was voted the greatest Britain of all time by, by the British people. Well, he comes from a very uh, wealthy and prominent family in British history. He's a descendant of John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough. Uh, John Churchill was a war hero in the early 18th century, the leader of a British army under Queen Anne that won the uh, Battle of Blenheim against the, the forces of the French King Louis XIV in 1704, and afterwards built a, a tremendous uh, country house uh, named Blenheim um, near Oxford in England. And this was um, one of the great you know, noble families of the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, Winston Churchill was the son of one of the uh, younger sons of the uh, Duke of Marlborough. So he was not the inheritor of a noble title himself. His father was uh, Lord Randolph Churchill, who was a prominent member of parliament in the late 19th century, was chancellor of the Exchequer at one point. Um, Winston Churchill started his career in the military, and, but also uh, gained fame as a war correspondent, uh, writing about uh, what he saw in Cuba, Afghanistan, Sudan, South Africa, wrote best-selling books. And he, he was able to use his family connections to get himself put in the most interesting places where he could see these things and, and write about them. Uh, his writings about uh, Cuba was before he actually started active duty as a soldier. This is in the 1890s when Cuba was still under Spanish control. And there was a, a rebellion against the Spanish authorities in Cuba around 1895, I believe. I forgot the date right. And Churchill maneuvered himself into a position where he could go and, and, and just observe and, and send missives back to the British papers. So he goes to Cuba and he gets up there, he's with the government forces and he's just observing the fighting and he would write back these uh, letters to the papers in Britain saying, so the government forces and the rebels, they spend hours shooting at each other and then it gets to the middle of the day and, and both sides stop and they have a siesta. You know, they, they break for lunch, they sleep for an, another hour or two and they wake up and they start shooting at each other again. And so the, 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 the way in which he would describe these incidents was was very gripping and very interesting to the British readership. And so his his uh, correspondence became very popular. And then later he would write books about what he had seen. He was posted with a cavalry unit in northern India and went up into Afghanistan and was witnessed to, um, as an active duty soldier, witnessed uh, some of the, the fighting there in Afghanistan in the 1890s. Then he got himself posted to the Sudan and actually took part in the last British cavalry charge, uh, the last cavalry charge of the British Army at the Battle of Omdurman, and then later on went down uh, to South Africa after he uh, was no longer an active duty soldier, just went down as a war correspondent again to look at the Boer War. While he was there, he was captured by uh, the Boers and was in prison, but then later escaped from prison and because the, the war had been going very badly for the British at that point, when the news came out about Winston Churchill escaping from the Boer prison, he became a sort of national hero. So he comes back to Britain and uh, runs for Parliament successfully. And uh, from 1900 on, he's in Parliament for most of the rest of his life, a uh, career in Parliament that went for more than 60 years. Started off as a, a member of Parliament for the Conservatives, but then in 1904, broke with the Conservative Party over the issue of free trade. This is when Joseph Chamberlain is coming in and, and uh, trying to influence the Conservative Party into raising tariffs, what they called the tariff reform, and 
Churchill did believe in the free trade position, so he broke with the conservatives and went over to the liberals and enjoyed a, a meteoric rise within the liberal party. He became very close to David Lloyd George and uh, supported Lloyd George in that people's budget of 1909 that provoked the constitutional crisis with the House of Lords. We talked about that in an earlier lecture. And then uh, got himself in, uh, appointed first Lord of the Admiralty uh, when he was still in his 30s, around 1912 or so. So this was a um, you know, very rapid rise through the ranks. And, uh, and then the war begins, World War I. Churchill is the, the guy who uh, tried to organize and then took the blame for the disastrous Gallipoli invasion uh, of the Ottoman Empire in 1915. So when the liberal party had to go to a coalition government with the conservatives, because Churchill had, had burned a lot of bridges and made a lot of enemies in the conservative party, one of the things they insisted on was that Churchill had to be out. He could no longer be in a cabinet position. So Lloyd George gave him the boot, and uh, he wound up in some very minor position, which kind of graded on him. He decided that he wanted to go to the front, and he actually went to the Western Front, uh, spent almost a year there, and lived in the trenches and did all that. I mean, wh whatever else uh, you might say about Winston Churchill, uh, no one ever doubted his his personal courage. He was always willing to uh, you know, get into very dangerous situations and always prided himself on d having developed and sustained the, the martial virtues. This is one of the things that he thought um, the British population was in danger of losing uh, throughout his life. He wanted to encourage uh, British men to uh, seize hold of these uh, traditional military virtues of courage and daring and that sort of thing. So he was always willing to lead from the front in those situations. Because he did have skill as an administrator, Lloyd George eventually brings him back and makes him minister of munitions in the last part of the war. And then, um, as another, you know, he's back in the, in the government. And when the war ends, he's one of the voices that says, we need to send troops into Russia. This is after the October Revolution in 1917. And the, the Russian Civil War is going on. Churchill believed that the communist government under Lenin was still very vulnerable and that if British supplies and troops could go in to help the whites in the Russian Civil War, that uh, they could undo the uh, communist revolution. But in the end, there was not a big push to do that. Um, years later, um, there, were some, uh, there were some British soldiers temporarily stationed in one of the ports in Russia. And years later, when Churchill and Stalin were talking, that was still an, an, an episode that caused bad blood. Was, uh, Stalin still held a grudge uh, for Churchill's advocacy of sending in troops to overthrow the communist government. In 1924, after the Liberal Party has fallen on very hard times, and Churchill was briefly out of office, uh, he did uh, lose his seat uh, uh, after the war, he becomes. Um, Another uh, flip flopping again, he goes back over to the Conservative Party and remained in the Conservative Party for the rest of his political career. He was made Chancellor of the Exchequer in uh, the mid 1920s, and he is the guy who uh, puts Britain back on the gold standard. Now, if you know anything about economic history, uh, the British government had gone off the gold standard during World War I because it couldn't afford. Uh, to redeem all of the uh, money that it had printed. So for Churchill, this was um, a point of national pride that the, the pound had to be uh, put back on the original pre-war gold standard in order to uh, maintain British prestige. Well, the economic reality was that the government could not afford to maintain that peg of, of the pound to gold. Uh, to go back on the gold standard, which in and of itself was not a bad idea, but it needed to go back onto the gold standard at uh, a, a lower exchange, in other words, where a, a pound would not be worth as much gold as it had been before the war. But again, for Churchill, this would be demeaning to British pride. So he says, no, we've got to go back on the pre-war um, rate. And then when the Depression hits, the government is forced to abandon the gold standard once again because it can't uh, maintain it. And so Churchill takes the blame for a lot of that. 
throughout the 1930s, most of the 1930s, he's no longer in a cabinet position. And Churchill would later um, describe this as, these were the years that I spent in the wilderness. Well, and it was not really, he wasn't in the wilderness. He was a member of parliament throughout the period, one of the most prominent people, best known people in British political life. And he um, spent a lot of his time writing best-selling books that made him huge sums of money. He was making um, you know, the equivalent of millions of dollars a year from his uh, book royalty. So he was doing very well. He just wasn't in a cabinet position. He was uh, one of the people who who tried to support Edward VIII in 1936 when Edward had become king, but there was a, a, a big problem, a constitutional crisis, because he was in love with an American divorcee and he wanted to marry her. This is a woman named Wallace Simpson. And he was told by uh, by his father, uh, the dying king Edward uh, Edward the uh, sorry George V, that um, you cannot marry this woman because you are going to be the head of the Church of England, and the Church of England opposes divorce. So you can't be the head of the Church of England um, and you know have have married this woman. It's it's a it's a contradiction. So you've, you you got to choose one or the other: be the king or uh, marry Wallace Simpson. Well, Edward VIII went on national radio and said, I'm in love with this woman, I'm going to marry her, and I'm abdicating. Now, Churchill had supported um, Edward, trying to hope that he would be able to marry her and be the king, and um, he lost uh, political capital as a result of that because the the opinion was overwhelmingly against uh, that happening. Uh, But even though his reputation among his conservative colleagues was at a fairly low ebb there in the late 1930s. Uh, He was the guy who is saying, we can't appease Hitler. That made him even more unpopular. We can't appease Hitler. Hitler's a threat. He's uh, He means to launch a war at some point. He also argued strenuously against the idea of giving India independence. He was a lifelong uh, supporter of the idea of the British Empire. So he's on the outs with a lot of his uh, conservative colleagues. But when war occurs in 1939 and Britain declares war on Hitler after the invasion of Poland, uh, Neville Chamberlain, the prime minister, makes Churchill the first lord of the admiralty. So the same position he had um, had at the beginning of World War I. And then after the rapid successes that Hitler had in Western Europe in 1940, Neville Chamberlain decided that he had to resign as prime minister, that he wasn't the man to, to lead the government at that point. And because Churchill had, had you know, was now able to position himself as, I'm the guy who predicted all this. You should have listened to me all this time. So, so now Churchill gets called in by uh, the new king, George VI, and says, uh, you're going to be the prime minister. So it's 1940 that uh, when a lot of people thought that Britain would have to negotiate a peace with Hitler that would be very disadvantageous to British interests, Churchill says, no, even though France has been defeated, even though Norway has been defeated, we're going to stand and fight. And so we've got uh, Churchill's recalcitrance there, uh, trying to inspire the British people through his radio addresses and speeches. And we've got the Battle of Britain going throughout 1940, in which Hitler was entertaining the idea of trying to invade Britain, uh, but he was not able to establish air superiority over the English Channel. So ultimately, he abandoned that plan. And so now uh, Churchill is is uh, seen as a national hero for rallying the British people there in the summer of 1940. When the war ends in 1945, of course, I realize I'm skipping over a lot of the, the war years, but when the war ends in 1945, the conservatives lose the post-war election. Labor uh, wins the election. Now, Churchill at that point uh, had been prime minister, although he was not the leader of the conservative party. He was overseeing during the war years a coalition government of conservative and labor. They said we have a national government to fight this war. And uh, even though he was the prime minister, he tried to remain sort of above the partisan fray. But in 1945, the um, the British electorate went for labor and Churchill was out as prime minister. He comes back again later in 1951, uh, but by that time, the uh, um, Labor Party has nationalized a bunch of the major industries, created the National Health Service, socialized medicine, um, nationalized the coal mines, the railroads, a lot of the key industries. And Churchill does not try to undo any of that. 
um, when he's prime minister again later. So uh, this this um, discussion of Churchill has, has run on quite a bit, but let's come down to you know how should the conservative or the libertarian assess Churchill? Is he the man of the century? Is he the greatest Briton of all time? Well, the people who champion Churchill as the great leader, I mean, it all comes down to his actions in 1940. And certainly if you listen to the speeches that he made in 1940, they are very effective. They are very inspiring. Churchill was a master of English prose and a master of speech writing and rhetoric. He could really give a good speech. So you've probably heard some of these, Will. We'll fight them in the air. We'll fight them on the beaches, all, all that sort of thing. Never have so many owed so much to so few. Those, those kinds of very memorable lines that, that Churchill makes uh, in, in his speeches. So it's that memory of Churchill in 1940. He recognized that was the, the year that made him the hero. And, and when he was later asked, if there was any year that you could live over again, what year would it be? And he said, 1940 every time. So... It's that that moment of crisis where he shows that resolve and determination and people really admired that. But there is a revisionist view that I think has some merit to it that has been articulated by classical liberal and conservative uh, writers like Ralph Rako and, and Patrick Buchanan, who, uh, who argue that uh, you know, throughout his career, there are many times when Churchill very clearly exercised poor judgment and took unnecessary risks was very rash in, in the decisions, and, and that led to unhealthy outcomes. He urged the conservative government to issue Poland a war guarantee in 1939 that uh, then obligated Britain either to declare war on Hitler, a war that Britain was not ready to fight, or, or to uh, lose international credibility. And then, as First Lord of the Admiralty in the spring of 1940, he... Uh, did some things off the Norwegian coast that, that provoked uh, the, the Nazi invasion of Norway in 1940. His refusal to negotiate, and here's one of the things that some people re really come down on Churchill for, because he refused to negotiate a peace with, um, with Hitler, this leads to uh, tens of millions of further deaths in the war. And, and, and what did Britain gain from that? Uh, Britain comes out of World War II no longer a world power. It did not achieve its pre-war aims of protecting Poland. Poland winds up in communist hands and suffers greatly. All of Eastern Europe, you know, winds up under communist uh, domination. So they they pay a terrible price, and it's questionable whether they really got anything out of it. They can say, yeah, well, we defeated Hitler, we won the war, but is Britain better off if, he, if he's the leader of the British government? Uh, and also there's the, the Holocaust question. All the, you know, Churchill and the Western allies could not prevent the Holocaust. And because they fought against Hitler, the argument goes, and Hitler invades Western Europe, which Hitler apparently had no intention of doing. Um, he, all indications were that after he had conquered Poland, he would have gone on to declare war against the Soviet Union. That was his grand strategy. But because of the declarations of war by Britain and France in 1939, Hitler spends 1940 attacking Western Europe. And all the Jews in Western Europe who wind up getting deported to the camps, uh, those people would, would have been spared. Jews from France and, and Norway and other places that the, the Nazis uh, overran. So uh, there are many deaths that, that could have been avoided had uh, Churchill been willing to negotiate uh, a, a peace there. And then there's also the... Um, episodes in the war that if uh, the Nazis had done, you know, they, they would have been charged for war crimes afterwards. There are, you know, civilian bombings and other episodes that Churchill authorized that uh, even his supporters after the fact would say, yeah, if we, uh, you know, if we lose this war, um, you know, we're, we're going to be strung up uh, for this because this is what would ultimately become to known as a crime against humanity. And then Churchill's also complicit in the post-war ethnic cleansing of uh, the Western part of what is now Poland of Germans. Millions of Germans were uprooted from their homes and hundreds of thousands of them died uh, as the um, Russians and uh, the Polish, the communist Polish government forced them um, westward because they redrew the, the boundary lines of Poland after World War II. So there's a, there's a pretty robust case to be made that Churchill should not be seen as uh, the great leader. And, um, in, in the recommended readings, I'll, I'll put um, references to these uh, to these scholars. 
All right, so to sum up this lecture, we've got uh, in the post or interwar period in the United States, uh, conservatism and classical liberalism converge to some degree, but in Britain, classical liberalism uh, to a great extent fades away and is no longer a powerful political force. Conservatives do uh, eventually adopt some of the classical liberal ideas. So some of the conservatives like, like Churchill are still champions of free trade, for example. But the classical liberals are no longer a, a potent political force. Throughout the interwar period, conservatives generally were anti-war, wanted to maintain peace. Um, and Churchill is actually not very representative. Uh, the, the hawkish um, position that he took in the 1930s was not very representative of conservatives across the board. But ever since the war, you know, Churchill is now sort of the archetype of the uh, self-described conservative hawk. So we can't allow the would-be Hitlers of the world to threaten international peace. So this is why you've got you know, ever since that time, conservative writers who would say things like, we can't uh, negotiate with these communists or whoever because it would be like Munich 1938 all over again. We can't appease these would-be dictators and so on and so forth. So that helps to set up uh, the posture of uh, a number of uh, conservatives in the post-war period. All right, folks, that's our episode for today. Coming up later this week, by the way, I'm going to be doing a solo episode where I'm going to more or less reproduce at least the main themes of a talk I gave aboard the Contra Cruise. And I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy this because here, I'm basically what I'm going to do is, is address a lot of claims that Keynesians make where they claim that we're just ideologically blinded and they are the dispassionate scientists sifting through the evidence. And that's just not so. And we're just going to, I'm going to have example after example after example. And that particular myth is going to be clobbered mercilessly. So watch for that. Make sure you're a subscriber, especially those of you who listen on YouTube. Nothing wrong with listening on YouTube, but help me out by subscribing on iTunes as well. I guess now they want to call it Apple Podcasts. So TomWoods.com slash Apple is how you can subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.